I think it is clear to believe in the power of ideas. Fresh thinking of the Manhattan Institute. Good evening, I'm Larry Mohn, president of the Manhattan Institute. It's a pleasure to welcome everyone to this very special uh, book release forum. Tonight's forum is the uh, first official event under the auspices of E21, which is a new center of the Manhattan Institute has launched to propagate new economic ideas and policies for the 21st century. Uh, based in Washington, E21 also gives us an enhanced presence in the nation's capital, so be on the lookout for economic policy proposals coming out from E21. Uh, judging from the roster of speakers assembled this evening, I would say we're off to a pretty good start. Tonight, I have the great honor and privilege of introducing uh, Larry Lindsay, who is an old friend of the Manhattan Institute. I won't go through Larry's whole bio. As, as you can see in your program, though, he's taught at Harvard, served in both Bush administrations, and has been a governor of the Federal Reserve System. He is uh, currently president and CEO of the Lindsay Group. I met Larry. 25 years ago uh, when we first talked about writing a book for the Manhattan Institute that chronicled the real results of the Reagan tax cuts. And the outcome of that discussion, uh, the growth experiment, was one of the most influential public policy books of its time. There's been a lot of misinformation and bad analysis on tax policy over the ensuing two decades, especially over the past several years. We've lost intellectual ground in a lot of ways. Uh, that's why I was very excited when Amity Schles encouraged Larry and the Manhattan Institute to join forces once again uh, to update the growth experiment. Uh, Larry is eminently qualified to correct the record, which I think he does brilliantly in this new book, The Growth Experiment Revisited, Why Lower, Simpler Taxes Are America's Best Hope for Recovery. Uh, the book couldn't be more timely, and its message couldn't have a better messenger. Uh, in my opinion, Larry has the same unique quality uh, that Milton Friedman possessed. Not only does he have a first-rate economic mind, but he also has the ability to effectively communicate his ideas to non-economists. The Manhattan Institute is thrilled to be working with him once again and doing our best to get his important ideas before the public's attention. Please join me in welcoming me back to the Manhattan Institute, Larry Lindsay. Thank you, Larry, for those very, very kind words, and thank you all for coming tonight. I, I really appreciate it. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's like having a child, I guess, although I've never had, uh, had one myself, but uh, give, giving, giving, giving birth to a, uh, to a book is, is quite an experience. Uh, there are a lot of people that I want to thank, obviously, uh, Larry and the Manhattan Institute and, and everyone here for coming. Uh, a few special people, though, if you'll forgive me. Uh, the first is my mom, for whom, who is here tonight and who, uh, <laughs> with, 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 without whom the book would not have been written, um, uh, <laughs> needless to say. Um, I, uh, I'd also like to thank um, uh, my staff, uh, who is also here tonight. A lot of them, uh, the book could not have helped, uh, been, been done without their cooperation. Uh, uh, Carolyn and uh, 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 Jamila and Andrew Sacker uh, were really key to it. And one other person, if you'll forgive me, uh, again, without whom the book would have been written, that's Marty Feldstein. Uh, Marty was my, uh, my thesis advisor. He's been a great friend, and, um, and we've shared many ideas. And, and he's also a co-conspirator on trying to get a better tax policy. Well, 25 years is a long time. And yes, it was 25, and, and so... We were both very, very young at the time, I'm sure. Um, one of the interesting things about writing a book that uh, lasts 25 years, or especially when you're doing it, is you've noticed how much things have changed. And you say, oh, did I really write that? There's a lot of minutia in there. Uh, one of the problems we had, it was an editorial problem, was back 25 years ago, we all talked about GNP, 
And now we all talk about GDP. And I hadn't even realized we made the change, but we decided nah, not to revise the whole book because of it. But those are those little issues. There are other, I think, uh, important issues. Uh, the first is the lessons of the 1980s really haven't been repealed. I know, uh, as Larry said, there's a lot of uh, rewriting of history, revisionism here, uh, particularly about what happened in the 1990s. And one of the important parts of the book was to extend the analysis we used on the Reagan tax cuts um, into uh, the 1990s. And you know, I, I, I gotta tell you, um, the things I'm about to tell you, you probably haven't seen in the New York Times. Um, <laughs> you've seen Putin, but you haven't seen the, these things. <clears throat> the first is, uh, and, and it took some research for me to confirm this. Do you know that in the 1990s, on net, even if you look at static scoring, taxes weren't increased, they were actually cut. The uh, tax cuts of 1995, according to the um, uh, Joint Committee on Taxation, were larger than the tax increases of 1993, which kind of makes it hard to claim that tax increases were the cause of what happened in the 1990s. Uh, the second interesting fact about the 1990s, and um, for those of you who thumb through it, my favorite chart is on page 187. It takes a look at what happened to uh, bond prices, and particularly the difference between bond yields and short-term yields during the 1990s. And remember, the, some of us were told, some people believe, that it was the tax increases of uh, 1993 that set off the big bond rally, and as a result, uh, the boom of the 1990s. Well, you can take a look at the table, and. What you see is a lot of squiggly lines. They go up and down, up and down, including 93. I mean, yeah, there was a little bit of a squiggle down, and then you had to squiggle back up again. There is only one event that stands out as the market's own view of what was really important in the 1990s. And that happened in the first week of November 1994. The whole action of the 90s, the whole improvement in the outlook for the American economy happened when the Republicans took control of the Congress had nothing to do with uh, who was president at the time. And we had the biggest bond rally uh, in history as a result. Again, uh, I don't know if there's anyone here from the Times, but they might consider reporting that. <laughs> Third piece, <clears throat> well, forget the 95 tax cuts and the 93 tax increases. Even if you buy the 93 tax increases, their total value, according to the official scoring by the Joint Committee on Taxation, amounted to only 7%, 7% of the total revenue increase by the end of the decade. Now, if you think higher the tax increases caused the recovery, which is a stretch, why is it that 7% that caused them? What actually caused taxes to go up if it wasn't those. Well, a good portion of it was economic growth that would have happened anyway. But there were two other factors that were far more important. Uh, the first is something called real bracket creep. When incomes go up, people get pushed into higher tax brackets. We all know that experience. We don't know and love it. We know it. That actually has a particularly devastating effect on the middle class. And if you actually look at the numbers, the tax rates, the average tax rates on the middle and upper middle classes went up in the Clinton years, whereas they went down slightly at the top of the income distribution. Second great change in the 1990s was a rise in income inequality. Income inequality went up more under eight years of Clinton than it did under eight years of Reagan and eight years of George W. Bush combined. Income inequality went up more then in eight years than it did in the other 16. Again, not part of the conventional wisdom. Well, why does that produce revenue? Well, when income inequality increases, i.e. the rich get a bigger share of the pie, the rich pay a higher average rate than everyone else, and so a bigger portion of the tax base is taxed at a higher rate. 
that was worth two and a half times as much in terms of revenue as was the statutory changes that happened in 93. Again, you can find all the fun facts and figures in the book. So that was, I think, an important lesson, that the story we're being told about the 1990s just doesn't comport with the facts. The second piece, and this came because since I wrote the first version of the book, I've been a Fed governor, was how intricately related monetary and fiscal policy are. Now, we knew that in the 1980s because we learned about uh, the effects of, uh, of bracket creep and the president did something about it. What was very interesting was, again, how important the 1990s and the bubble caused by monetary policy was in the 1990s at pushing up tax revenue. Not only did it push everyone into higher tax brackets, but it caused a good portion of that increase in income inequality, which was a big contributor to revenue. Monetary policy and tax policy are tied. It is something we are going to have to learn painfully in the years ahead as we go through both a fiscal adjustment and a monetary policy adjustment. And the final thing I learned in those 25 years was we looked at numbers a lot. And I'm an economist, and quantifying things are, is a very important thing to do. But I think that, uh, that quality uh, needs more attention and not just quantity. That how much revenue you raise is, uh, is important, but it may be secondary to how you raise it. We learn that in, in lots of ways. We learn, for example, that some of the reforms Reagan did, such as income tax indexing, had a very important effect on how people did labor contracts, on wage demands, whatever, and actually helped, I think, reduce the amount of uh, inflation that we had after indexing came in because people needed a smaller wage increase in order to stay even when they weren't pushed into higher brackets by inflation. We learned how important ending the marriage penalty was. Again, you can look at female labor force participation. It didn't surge under Clinton. It started to surge in 1981 and 1982. Why? Not only were middle and upper class, upper middle class tax rates cut sharply, but Reagan actually brought in a special marriage penalty relief that lowered the taxes on the lower earning spouse. The importance of taxes on, on uh, social changes is also important. And finally, and this is the conclusion of the book, um, and this is a very hard thing for any author to write. I was, uh, I think I was wrong back in 1988 when I, I wrote the first version. I was wrong about uh, the idea that we should use the tax code to accomplish various objectives. Well, it certainly was an unpopular view. Uh, as Chairman Campbell told, we use the tax code to do just about everything. Trouble is, when you use the tax code to do just about everything, you forget about its key mission, which is to raise revenue to pay for the government. And as a result, I think we've created a monstrosity that uh, defines income badly, leads to excessive complexity, uh, adds enormous costs to uh, raising revenue. And um, I have come around to the view that maybe what we have to do is cut the Gordian knot here and move away from income-based taxation to something based more on uh, business cash flow. Well, I won't, uh, I won't scoop the own book. You have to go read it. You have to read what it says in the last chapter. Uh, but that is, uh, that is where I head. But again, I want to thank you all for coming tonight. It's very kind of you. And I want to thank the Manhattan Institute and the panel and every, everyone uh, uh, for, uh, for helping me out with this book. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. And we really have a great uh, group of people to, to further the discussion and comment. And uh, I'm very pleased and grateful that uh, Paul Gigot, the editor of the Wall Street Journal editorial page, will be leading this discussion. As many of you know, uh, the, that page was the midwife of many of these those ideas over the years, so we're really pleased. So, Paul, I will uh, turn everything over to you at this point. All right, thank you very much. Uh, uh, and sorry for that uh, little detour, but thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Larry, for the introduction. Uh, thank you all for coming, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you to the Manhattan Institute a partner in crime uh, uh, <laughs> of ours on many an occasion. And it's great to be here with, uh, with uh, colleagues old and new. Um, 
my job here is to moderate and have a try to um, stir up a little trouble, I hope. Uh, and, uh, um, and first, though, we're going, I want to introduce uh, the other two members of our panel. And then the idea is that uh, they'll speak for each for about five minutes. And then we'll go round about here on, on stage for a while and then open it up to you all for, for some questions, um, where I hope you can stir up a little trouble, too. Um, so um, the other two uh, uh, panelists, very distinguished, just to introduce uh, uh, in the middle, Dave Camp, who is uh, one of the most respected uh, uh, members of Congress, and not merely because he is the chairman of the most powerful committee in, uh, in Congress, the Ways and Means Committee. Uh, he's now in his 12th term from a uh, congressman from central Michigan. Um, he is, uh, well, is known for his inclusive manner, as well as his mastery of policy. He was an expert for a long time on trade policy, but in the last two years has been conducting what I would call a kind of uh, congressional seminar on tax reform with hearing after hearing after hearing on details. I don't know how you do it, frankly. Uh, but he has, uh, he's trying to, um, to, to, to really to, to work with Max Baucus of the Senate Finance Committee and pass a serious tax reform. We'll see if he can do it, but if anybody can, I think it's uh, Congressman Camp. I would also say that one of his passions in Congress has been adoption policy and promoting adoption, and he's done things through tax incentives as well as uh, uh, getting the State Department to help Americans who want to adopt abroad, uh, and I salute him for that. Uh, to my immediate left, Dan Loeb is uh, the chair, the founder and CEO of Third Point LLC, the hedge fund and uh, activist uh, investor. Some of you may have read about his uh, 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 actions regarding uh, investing regarding Yahoo and Sony and, and, and other companies. Uh, he is uh, uh, also famous in the financial world for writing uh, public letters which have been known to say, uh, how to put this delicately, candid things about uh, various CEOs and companies, as well as on occasion, the President of the United States. Uh, he's also a, uh, a philanthropist, and a very notable one, and particularly one of his, one of his causes is, uh, is school choice and reform. Uh, he is uh, 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 on the board, I think, of Students First, the Michelle Rhee uh, Reform Group, and uh, uh, as well as the various charter schools in New York. Uh, I was, uh, and this has not come without some professional cost. Some of you may have read earlier this year where the head of the teachers union was trying to rally public pension funds against uh, investing in, pension fu in hedge funds which uh, promoted uh, pension reform and charter schools and school reform. Well, Dan uh, never backed down, and in fact, uh, at an event I was at, I was in fact his guest at a, the Harlem Success Academy fundraiser this year, which- Success Academy Charter Schools. Yeah, Success Academy Charter Schools. Um, he, uh, uh, he stood up and said uh, that uh, he and his wife were donating personally $2 million to the effort, and then he said that's what he had planned to give, and then he thought that since Randy Weingarten had made such an issue of it, he was going to donate another million and make it three. Uh, and uh, uh, that got a big round of applause. So uh, let me uh, start. Uh, why don't, uh, Congressman, you, uh, you start? Well, well, thank you, Paul, very much. Um, and thank you all for coming. Uh, I don't know if many of you know, but uh, the past three Congresses, as I've led the committee, we've started off each Congress with, a, with a, a seminar, if you will, to get all the members sort of involved on policy. And Larry has been kind enough to come each of those three times and been the keynote speaker at all of those and really given us you know, the up-to-date, insightful economic analysis that we need as we try to deal with tax policy, trade policy, and all the other issues that come before the committee. But um, I, I guess, I, I think the real, first of all, I, I very much enjoyed uh, reading the growth experiment, experiment revisited. And uh, it, what really is, what, what is really driving us in, the, in at least me and our committee is that we really aren't seeing the kind of economic growth that we need to see. I mean, they've revised it, and correct me if I say anything incorrectly about the economy, but to about 2.5%, that's not even enough to take care of population growth. So you've got about half of college graduates, 52%, are either unemployed or underemployed. And any of us who have nieces or children that are in their 20s, 
they get internships, they don't get jobs, and more than ever are living at home. Um, so we aren't seeing either, while there are some bright spots in the, in the economy, um, certainly financially in the financial markets, uh, the fundamentals just aren't there. So what we're trying to do is find a way um, to get more economic growth, and, and clearly Larry's book, which outlines, really goes back to the Coolidge tax plan and traces the, most importantly in the 80s and 90s though, what policies really mean and what they do. Because in Washington we get stuck in what they call static scoring, which is the Joint Committee on Taxation, that's our official referee, and uh, they often just sort of look at a, a um, binary sort of choice, either this, you know, there's either revenue lost <laughs> or revenue gained, and uh, they assume that the that tax um, policy doesn't change behavior. And clearly, Larry's analysis shows that it does. And you want to have the right kind of policies that, that work in the right ways. The other thing that they always assume is a static economy. That means that if investment grows, employment would have to shrink because the economy cannot change. And we, all, we know that in the real world, you can get a growing investment sector and a growing employment sector. So we've uh, uh, obviously been working, I've been working for the last two and a half years on this. We've had lots of hearings, as, as Paul mentioned, lots of bipartisan meetings and effort to try to move this forward. Obviously, our tax code is a mess. Um, over the last 10 years, there have been 4,000 changes to the tax code. That's about one a day. Um, and We've had hearing after hearing, and, and there's obviously two sides, a business side to our tax code and a personal side, or, and I, we think we should do both, not only for what we call C corporations, mo may, many of them are international businesses that do business around the world, also, but also for individuals and pass-through entities. That's a, a big part of our, the majority of our economy now is what we call pass-through entities, where individuals actually file as individuals, but they're running a business. And so we're trying to do both of those um, in a way that will really kind of create the growth and jobs and higher wages that we're not seeing, that we just have not seen in this recovery. And maybe that's because I'm from Michigan, but we need to see some growth. And there is an opportunity to do it. Um, and I think the, the other thing that's also driving this is complexity. I think the average person should be able to fill out their own taxes. And even if you have a small business, your cost of compliance is huge. We've had many, many individuals and businesses come in and, and really talk about the complexity. And it is really a strong issue. And the, and, and, and the reason is we sign this paper every year, or this bundle of papers, and send them in the IRS, and frankly, we don't really know what we're signing. And so when they come calling, it's a very stressful thing because oftentimes it's so, so complicated. So I think the average small business, the average person, so simplification is the second key pillar that we're looking at, growth and simplification. And that's what we're trying to do. So I just appreciate Larry's guidance on this because a lot of the principles he talks about in this book are principles that will really help us um, not only try to create more investment, which helps with the jobs, but also trying to get a code that um, will help our economy grow and not be a hindrance, and it is a huge weight. Uh, right now, about $168 billion in compliance per year or more, depending on how you calculate it, and billions of hours that are spent on compliance and not on growth. So I look forward to uh, the discussion tonight. Thank Great. you. Thank you, uh, Congressman. Dan. Well, thanks for having me here tonight. And um, thanks for the Manhattan Institute for, for being here. I'm actually a trustee of the Manhattan Institute. It's been great for me in my evolution. and understanding of how the world works. And thanks to you for the editorial page. I can't tell you, particularly during the last election, uh, how many times my head almost exploded. And uh, I would read the soothing pages of the editorial page and realize that there was some reason and sensibility left in the world and someone who thought like I did. I just wish we'd been more uh, effective. <laughs> <laughs> well, g g given, the, given the mayoral elections here, we're gonna need a lot more uh, of, of the soothing balm of the editorial page. And uh, I've had the pleasure of working with Larry as a subscriber and client, and he is a brilliant man, and I've really come to respect him. We wrote an editorial for the journal on the 
uh, situation in Japan on the third era, reforms, and it was just astounding to me how much information he could synthesize and, and uh, express in a really concise way and quickly too. And uh, Congressman Camp, thank you for your service to the country. I can imagine working in the House is incredibly gratifying. I'm sure it has its occasional challenging moments too. Uh, yes, it does. <laughs> and, um, uh, you know, I think there are those moments. Uh, I, th I think Michelle Obama said how people should go out and think about doing service. I don't think she had Congress in mind, but I really do think that's an incredible thing to do. So anyway, I had a few, excuse the prepared remarks, I'm not a politician, I'm not a professor, so I, I, my extemporaneous abilities aren't as good as theirs, so I'll try to not re sound like I'm reading this. But uh, anyway, I read the growth experiment and revisited it. It reminded me of reading the updated versions of another classic, Hayek's Road to Serfdom, which was written in the 40s with forwards written in 56 and 76. We had a chance to look back and update based on what he had seen. And uh, Hayek and Lindsay's book have both stood the test of time. Like Hayek's work, Lindsay deserves a fresh look and to be updated for, for subsequent events, which he has done. The book is both a course on the history of taxation and a critique of each epoch of tax since it was first introduced in the early part of the 20th century during Coolidge. Uh, in this new edition, we're also treated with updates that review the 90s, the 2000s, leading up to the financial crisis, crisis up to the present time. Larry also presents a rather dystopian view of the current direction of the country, the current $16 trillion deficit growing a trillion dollars a year, with the prospect of higher interest rates going, right now, rates are, we spend about $200 uh, billion a year, uh, with, with some modest increase in rates, that could go up to $600 uh, billion dollars a year, which would be basically equivalent to our defense budget and uh, close to a third, or al almost a third of the government budget. His solution is a radical prescription to simplify the tax system, broaden the base, lower rates, and increase revenues, all the while promoting a pro-growth policy. Uh, but Larry's book is more than a survey of the history of the in income tax from its inception to the present day. For Larry, the income tax tells a story not just of economics, but of political power and dominant social views. Underlying all this, though, is a study of first principles. Hayek said in his introduction, all I say is derived from certain ultimate values on which our whole argument depends. For Lindsay, he asks a very basic question. What is the purpose of the tax system? He concludes that the main goal of tax policy is to raise revenue in a way that minimizes the adverse consequences of economic growth. Who knew? As economists and business folk, we hope that even with some alternative agendas, whether they be promoting investment in certain industries like green energy. By the way, I went on the BLS, the Bureau of Labor Statistics website, because I was really curious about this, all these green energy jobs that have been created uh, during the administration. And I was imagining that there'd be people in semiconductors and creating new materials and all kinds of space agey stuff. The number one uh, job in, in the, under the classification of green energy, do you know what that is? I don't. It's uh, janitorial services. <laughs> High on the list is bus driver and air conditioner <laughs> repairman. So when you go through the government engineering of these green energy jobs, these are the types of jobs. Not that I'm not denigrating or denigrating those jobs at all. They're very important jobs. I just wouldn't necessarily categorize, categorize them as green energy. They say that you know, a janitor might replace a bulb, an incandescent bulb with a you know, long-lasting bulb, and that is their contribution. A cleaning person could use a green product and so forth. A bus driver who drives a natural gas bus is another example. Anyway, as I was saying, we have a complex tax system to promote all kinds of behaviors tax credits for having children, for installing solar panels, accelerated depreciation if you buy a fancy new jet. We also add taxes to things we don't like, like vices and the use of energy. The point that Larry makes is that with each incentive we allow our elected officials to make, the more we put the government in the business of picking winners and losers, we also let our elected officials subtly make decisions for us about how we conduct our affairs and live our lives. 
like Hayek, Lindsay asked the basic question, are resources better allocated by a system of central planning via tax code or otherwise, or by allowing individuals to organize their own affairs as they see fit? Part of the beauty of Larry's KISS, I gave away a little bit of the last chapter, keep it simple, stupid, tax policy, is it gives this decision-making power back to the citizens of the nation. The other thing I love about Larry, and which makes him such a great economist, is his fact and evidence-based approach to studying economics. Again, who knew? You should use facts and evidence. <laughs> the government, we assume, has somewhere in its set of objectives economic growth. Under the current administration, we hear more about inequality, fairness, and rich folks paying their fair share. It might surprise people that I agree with the president. There's too much inequality. In fact, the gap between rich and poor has increased under his presidency, as Larry pointed out, or he actually pointed that out about Clinton, but it's also true under this presidency, and that's not a good thing. The problem is the tax policy based on punishing the rich or ra raising rates so that they pay their fair share neither closes the yawning gap in the deficit nor does it improve the lives of the poor or the middle class it seeks to help. There's a redistribution of wealth all right, uh, but it's not from the rich to the poor or the middle class, but from the entire nation, rich, poor, and middle class, into the coffers of government to increase its size and scope. Which brings us back to the core principles of the book, lower rates, broaden the base, simplify the system. The Obama experiment has shown us that economic growth is not generated by government. Indeed, government can only impede it. Growth comes from the ingenuity and hard work of its people. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, uh, so let's, uh, let's start, and I hope you'll feel free to chime in whenever. But Larry, let me ask you, since your book is in part a history of, of recent uh, economic policy, I say recent going back 30, 40 years. I want to ask you about a, what I would call a tale of two tax cuts because there have been two real experiments, uh, to borrow your title, in uh, tax cutting under Republican governance uh, since the 1980s. There were the Reagan tax cuts and the Bush tax cuts. The Reagan tax cuts were not only economically successful, but they were a political success in that I think they, it's fair to say they changed the debate over tax policy in the United States. And uh, around the world, as you make clear in your book, everybody else decided we had to cut rates and the rest of the world went down in rates. And it had implications for the whole, for throughout the 1990s. So then you get to the 2000s and then there's another experiment in tax cutting. You were at the helm in the White House, 2001 followed by 2003 and yet that while you could argue had some economic success in the middle of the decade, I would argue it did, uh, it has not uh, uh, had the tremendous, it did not have the same growth effect as Reagan's tax cuts, and, uh, and politically clearly not uh, uh, as successful because now, in fact, the politics of tax cutting has changed. We've seen it in New York City where the Democratic primary winner basically argues the tax increases and in rates a must, that's his, the central part of his, of his campaign. So what's the difference? What happened? Why did one set of tax cuts work and so successfully and the other one less so? <clears throat> well, I think the, the key difference is the starting point. So uh, Reagan started with what was uh, palpably a disaster uh, and cutting rates from 70 to 50 and then uh, to 31. Um, well, you're gonna get a big payoff. But when you start with rates 39.6, uh, you're not starting with as bad a problem. And so by definition, it's the difference between you know, a radical change and an incremental change. And there's no, when you do an incremental change and there's no question that the 01 cuts were incremental, you're gonna have less of an impact than you do when you do a profound radical change. So I, you know, I, I even don't, don't think the comparisons are there. Um, I do think, though, that there were some similarities between the two. And um, again, we were going from a, a, a grand change to a small change. But in both cases, the idea was you wanted to do something that both would help the economy in the short run and help the economy in the long run and wouldn't do any harm. And I do document in the book some of the important short run uh, advantages that Bush got. We had a very, uh, we had a much more rapid turnaround uh, in economic growth uh, than we had uh, in the recent experience. No question. Um, and, uh, and so I think that was an effective deployment of tax policy. Um, and it was done relatively cheaply. I mean, everyone talks about how big the Bush tax cuts were. 
the Bush 2001 tax cut was, uh, was basically 1.2 trillion over 10 years. An Obama deficit is 1.4 trillion over one year. And so if you want to measure things in terms of effectiveness, I think you still got bang for the buck. But uh, uh, you know, I, I plead guilty to the fact that it did not have a profound change. I think it met the incremental changes that were needed at the moment, however. Would you feel better, uh, I mean, if you look at what happened after 2001, you got a little, it was the structure of the tax cut at first was, well, first of all, it was delayed. You had, a, you, you didn't, it was stretched out. Um, and it uh, also came in the form of tax rebates, uh, which were, some of us would argue, Keynesian in their structure. It was basically a, a, a check, you wrote checks for people, the, the premise was they were gonna spend it, and you did get a blip in GDP uh, in 2002, but you came right back down. And it wasn't until the 2003 tax cuts kicked in that you really saw the decade took, to take off. Any lessons there about the structure of tax policy? And does that affect how you, what, is that influenced one of your conclusions, which is that maybe you shouldn't have tax policy attended for, say, uh, uh, social policy like a child care tax credit? or child tax credit? Um, well, first, I plead guilty to, to everything I was just charged with. Um, <laughs> uh, no question about it. So, and, and, and maybe I should add that uh, in hindsight, we were trying to be too clever by half because we had one piece of legislation to handle what was both a short run and a long run problem. So uh, you're being clever politically, trying to maneuver it through. Well, I think there was a little economic cleverness in there too, but we'll, we'll see. So the short run problem was, uh, it's, it, it seems small now, but um, President Obama was not the only recent president to inherit a stock market crash. Uh, at the time, uh, we might remember the NASDAQ was down 75% when President Bush took office there had been a $6 trillion wealth loss before President Bush took office, which was the largest wealth loss since the Great Depression. We know what wealth losses do to economic growth. We had a short run problem. We designed a tax cut that was designed to put money at the two points of the economy where help was needed the most. The first was in consumer demand, in order to make up for what we now call the wealth effect, and our friends at the Fed refer to the wealth effect. And the second was the effect on small businesses. And most small businesses pay at the um, uh, individual rate, and so we had a sharp reduction in, uh, the, particularly at the top tax rate. So we put money for most middle class families with children, people who are inclined to spend the money because they have to, that was the child cut, and money at the small business level by cutting the top rate. I think it, given the challenges of the moment, we put the tax cuts in the places where they were going to have the biggest effect, and we did so relatively cheaply. Okay, um, Congressman, do you, um, do you have any, do you draw, what lessons do you draw? Because uh, I know you're a student of the tax reform of the 80s, uh, which passed in 1986, as Larry said, took the top rate from 50 to 28 temporarily, th with a little fiddle for 31 uh, in there worked in. But um, as you've seen these different tax cutting and reform experiments, what, what lessons, main lessons, do you draw for your uh, effort? Well, you know, I would, well, first of all, I think Larry correctly points out the damage that high marginal rates can do to economic growth in his book. And uh, I, would, I would say that the Reagan era tax cuts really were not only rate reductions, but also reform. And partly, as you said, because things were so bad. Right. The Bush era tax cuts were really more of a rate targeted certain areas, rate reductions, less reform-minded. Now, since the 86 tax cuts, I've said we've had all these additions to the code. The code is really a mess again. So we need to do, um, we need to reform the code in terms of simplicity and get growth, but we're gonna look at this in a revenue-neutral way. 
because uh, otherwise um, I, I think it makes it um, very difficult because you'll have you know, clear taxpayers that are winners and losers and there's this sense of, well, why should I be part of any reform effort if I'm the cash cow, if you will, in terms of that. So we're going to look at it a revenue neutral, but not revenue neutral in the terms of growth. And unlike in the uh, Reagan or Bush tax policy, we are actually going to have, because we put it into our House rules this time, that the Joint uh, Committee on Taxation will give us what's called a dynamic score, which will include you know, GDP growth, job growth. So we'll have an idea, at least an estimate. And as um, and, and, I, and we also hope other outside groups are modeling this as well. So there's been, I think as a result of the Reagan tax policy and Larry's book and other research, there's a whole another way of looking at what policy means for the economy, for jobs, and we're going to try to follow uh, in a way that we actually get growth. Uh. And uh, I guess, uh, uh, what makes you think that the time politically is ripe right now? Well, I think two things. Uh, the weight of all this complexity. Uh, really, as you go around the country and have hearings, the status quo is indefensible. People really are unhappy with the way things are. Um, and the economy hasn't really come back as it should. And that's significant. Uh, and you know, some people have said, well, so you're going to sell this as a, as a growth story. You as a growth it. story and a simplicity story. And, and really, as you, you know, some people say, well, this won't happen or you should wait. And the, and the problem is, um, you know, each year you wait, um, that's, that's a lot of, you don't want to become Japan and have, you know, a lost two decades or a lost decade. And we've, it's really been since 2008, and we really need, we need to move on this. So the idea is, obviously in the committees, to have the policy ready. And uh, if the policy's ready, then hopefully we can get it done. But that's the object. Dan, you got a, uh, uh, as you listen to this as a market practitioner, uh, does it leave you with any uh, confidence that it can get done uh, uh, anytime soon, tax reform? Well, um, it's going to be tough. <laughs> I don't want to be. Uh, Nothing else is in Washington, so. <laughs> I, I, I look forward to being pleasantly surprised. Okay, well, uh, uh, let me ask you this. <laughs> Warren, was pretty political. That was a good, Warren, good answer. It was. Warren Buffett uh, uh, once said famously that he never made an investment based on tax rates. You make investments all the time. How important to you and your, your uh, uh, colleagues are our tax rates uh, when you contemplate an investment? Well, first, I, I would challenge Mr. Buffett because anyone who buys a municipal bond obviously <laughs> makes that determination. And people make decisions around short term gains and long term gains. And uh, it's, it, it, it's silly. It's like he's trying to use his stature as this great investor to say that tax rates don't matter, and we see empirically it's just not true. Whether he said something that was untrue intentionally or otherwise, I don't know, but um, I, I'm, I'm no different than any other economic creature. I mean, we look at the net after-tax returns of what we do, and some of the things we do are quite risky. So if, if I feel like I have a partner, and I have two partners here, when I invest. I have the federal government, I actually have three. I have the federal government, I have the state, and I have the city. So our tax rates are, in some instances, actually going up to 17% state and local, because we also have an unincorporated business tax on a big chunk of our fees. So as we think about the riskier things that we do, we're only going to make 50 cents on the dollar at best, maybe even 45 cents on the dollar, given how high the marginal rates are, I mean, that would really give us pause and would uh, probably make us less likely to do riskier things and would certainly make people who do things like venture capital or very high, high value type investing less prone to do, to do it. You know, I just have to say tax policy affects behavior. 
And many uh, business people have come in and said, uh, international businesses particularly, that the rate is their main issue when they look at where to locate. And they have come to us and said, we're willing to give up everything to get to a 25% rate, which is our proposal, which has been in our budget, a 25% rate. Top rate now is 35. Yes. Statutory. The highest, the highest in the world. Other countries have moved downward. And so they say that it's very critically important. And clearly in Larry's book, he talks about how behavior is affected by, um, on the individual side as well. So it, I, would, I would agree completely. And Paul, right. you know, that comment by Mr. Buffett's a little bit surprising because Berkshire Hathaway is set up to take advantage of special tax treatment of insurance companies, which allows them to shelter a good portion of their income. So I'm not sure if he, uh, if he was completely ignorant of the tax code when he decided to use Berkshire Hathaway <laughs> as his, uh, as his um, Dan, you've been investing for, for a long time and you've seen uh, different cycles, uh, economic cycles and political cycles, but I want you to step back a bit and say, what, what is different about this environment right now, the whole investing, political, economic environment? Uh, what's different now uh, uh, be, between the, the today and what you experienced in previous decades? I mean, think about the, 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 the 80s, the 90s, 2000. I mean, clearly they're, they're, the stock market's doing great. Uh, if you're a hedge fund investor, you have a very nice run. Not so for the middle class, but what, what, what do you think for, what, what's the difference in terms of risk taking? Uh, is it better, worse, what? Well, because of the monetary policy, we're, we're doing just fine. But that's not really the policy, shouldn't be directed to improving the economic well-being of hedge fund managers and speculators and investors. It should really be geared towards improving the lives of everybody, which is what I care about, which is why I care so much about a structural issue. This doesn't involve taxation, but I care so much about K through 12 education, because it's a structural issue. But if you really want to improve the lives of everybody, rather than focus on rearranging the deck chairs or redistributing wealth, they really should be thinking more about growth. And as I said in my comments before, growth is something that businesses do. Governments don't make growth happen. They can get out of the way, they can um, provide certain infrastructure. Obviously, they have their primary role as defense and police and, and environmental protection and things like that, but it's really business. And what's different in this environment across the board is a contempt for people that create jobs, people who create jobs on a large scale, people who create jobs on a small scale, demonizing Walmart, demonizing fast food companies, demonizing banks. You know, all, all of these companies employ a vast number of people and have the potential to grow a lot more, but they are not being encouraged to do what they do. I think there's an idea that the only valid jobs are maybe if you're an internet web designer, like, was it Julie? Who was the girl in the... In the Julia. 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 The story like, that's Julia. a cool yes, job, yes. that's good. You know, if you have a hoodie and you're on Silicon Valley, that's cool. But if you're, you know, pro providing real energy, if you're a real energy provider, um, if you're, you know, like I, I don't want to pick any particular industries because they're all, they all form the complex web of businesses that make our society and make our system work. Um, so that's what I've seen that's different on, on a lot of levels. And look, no one's playing any violins for me, nor should they. Uh, and I'm not asking for that, but my concern isn't about the folks in this room who will do fine, who will do, all do fine, regardless who, who, who the mayor is or the president. But there's a lot of people out there who are hurting, and I think that they would, whether they're on welfare or they're underemployed or they're in a dead end job, I think they'd all be happier in a more having, first of all, having an education and the skills to enable them to advance themselves in life. But secondly, to work for companies or be associated with companies that are in this growth mode rather than this sort of stasis, which is a function of regulation, of concern about Obamacare, and just the general you know, mood, which is kind of not really pro-business. And that's something new, because Clinton, what, you didn't see that under Clinton, you didn't see that under Bush, and I just 
you haven't seen that, you know, going maybe back to uh, FDR to get that real sense of hostility towards business. Well, I mean, we're clearly out of step with the rest of the world on these issues. And um, Senator Baucus and I were visiting a large company in California that has plants all over the world. And they said that the difference in locating in the U.S. is a billion dollars in cost because of tax policy. That's over a 10-year period, or over the life of the plant. Uh, that's a big difference. And so we really, other countries have actually become very aggressive on this and are attracting, and we want U.S.-based platform companies doing business around the world. And so we, we really do have to make a change. The other thing is a difference between, I mean, obviously as, this, as technology and other things have changed, there are alternative investments around the world that are just as good as us. And our international tax code was written in the 60s, when the U.S. was really the dominant place for international companies to be, and most of them were based here, and we could kind of have the rules as we want them. So it's, it's really important that we, um, we, ad we address these issues as well. And um, many, and as I said, most business activity in the U.S. is done in a pass-through form, so we can't just look at what we call C corporations. We also have to look at the individual. Being subchapter S of the tax code, small business filing as uh, individual. Some uh, of them aren't so codes. small, but yes. Fair point. Fair point. Well, let me ask you about one of the one okay. political obstacle, uh, uh, which is a to tax reform. I think which has which has its roots uh, to some extent in the '90s um, in the various tax credits, which is that I think the figure now is 45% of, uh, of Americans don't pay any income tax. Of course, they pay the payroll tax, but they don't pay the income tax. And when you tried to, uh, when Ronald Reagan proposed his tax cuts, you had, uh, he could propose a tax cut for everybody by cutting rates for everybody. That's a lot harder to do now because a lot of people don't pay taxes. What, uh, uh, let me ask you first, Larry, is that, did, did uh, some of the, the tax cutters create a create our own uh, uh, problem here? And uh, what do you do about it? Uh, I guess guilty again. Um, Reagan took a lot of uh, people off the tax rolls That's as true. well. He, um, he doubled the personal exemption, for example, which uh, which was an important part of that. And um, uh, I think there was. Unlike the, the general perception, I think Republicans do care about uh, fairness and making sure that people um, who can't afford to pay taxes don't pay taxes. Um, but there was also a political deal. You know, you do look at distribution tables when you pass changes. Uh, one of the points the book makes is that the, uh, the much maligned Bush tax cuts for the rich actually weren't for the rich. Um, they um, that had a distributional effect that cut taxes more um, on middle and, and, and lower income people than it did at the top. Uh, and I think that's one of, that was certainly one of the motives in designing it the way it, it went. What I like about the KISS tax is that uh, for 100% of Americans as individuals, as families, um, April 15th will just become another day. And so you won't have this dichotomy of you pay taxes, you don't pay taxes. Um, and I think that that's going to be an important step forward to having a tax code that's focused on collecting revenue and not a lot of these political issues. Congressman, you have to deal with that, this issue directly because it does, the distribution tables will be looked at. Yes. What, uh, how, do you, how do you get around it? Well, we're going to have to have a plan that is pretty much distributionally neutral. Uh, otherwise, you run, I think, the mistake of the Romney campaign, which cut taxes for the you know, quote-unquote rich and raised taxes for the quote-unquote poor. Um, a lot of this was done not only in, uh, in raising the uh, standard deduction, but also in the refundability. And that has been expanded significantly by Presidents Clinton and Obama into a um, to a point where people are receiving more than their um, income tax payments, not necessarily more than their payroll taxes. But um, this is, once done, is very difficult to reverse because of that. And so 
that is a constraint that we have, and it's going to be huge. The other constraint that we have is the so-called fiscal cliff, where at the end of last year, and now that we've moved into a new budget window, there's $700 billion in tax revenue that is being paid by higher income levels that isn't going to come out of there. So we have a much harder uh, task this year than we would have last year had we been able to do this. Um, but um, one of the things we do have, at least now, is permanency in many areas of the code that are helpful. The, the uncertainty made it impossible to move forward on reform because of, and I don't want to bore everybody with baseline problems, but it made it very difficult to try to reach consensus. But at least with certainty, we know what those benchmarks have to be, and we can try to work within those. Refundability means that you get a tax, you get a check from the government even if you have no net uh, tax liability. Uh, income tax liability. Income tax yeah. liability. So whether it be an earned income tax credit or a child credit and that. Uh, right. uh, uh, so let's, uh, let's open it up to all of you, see if you have any uh, questions you want, to, uh, you want to ask. Does anybody, uh, we should have, uh, yes sir, right there. Do we have a, uh, yeah, let's get a microphone here, I think we do, great. I'm Bill Baldwin from Forbes. Question for Representative Camp. Is there any way to get a reform in place without creating either A, unfairness, or B, complexity? As an example, take away the home interest deduction. Well, you See, can. I bought a home yesterday that was going to pay, and yeah. you're going to take it away. Well, no. The answer is no. Um, First of all, we're not going to do any retroactive tax changes. So if you have a mortgage, we wouldn't go in and try to undo that contract. I think there'd be lots of legal problems with that. So what we'd be looking at is going forward. But yes, everything is going to be on the table. We're looking at all of it. And what I've said to my committee is our goal is a 25% rate, 10 and 25 on the individual side, 25 on the corporate side. We're starting with a clean sheet of paper. I think Senator Baucus calls it a blank slate. And it's not what comes out, but it's what goes in. And so what I'm saying to people is don't, don't think only of the one provision. You mentioned home mortgage deduction. But think of the context of a 25% rate. And with an income tax rate of 25%, many of these items uh, take on a different meaning because they're obviously in the code to reduce somebody's effective rate. Now, um, that one I don't consider one of the 4,000 loopholes that's been longstanding policy and has been our code, and we have to look at it very, very carefully because um, that is a policy decision. And, but are there ways of uh, looking at that moving forward? For example, and I'm, I'm not suggesting that we do away with it, but we're not, you know, Canada doesn't have one and their housing market thrives. But we're, we're not looking at eliminating necessarily these items, and there are some ways we can um, address them going forward in a way that they may not look exactly like they do now. But certainly, we would not take away somebody who has already got a mortgage. I know that's language that gets used a lot, but that's not what we're gonna look to do. The I other thing is, let me just say, it's easier to buy a house if the economy's growing and you have a job and you're getting wage increases. And when you track housing, it doesn't necessarily track exact tax policy. What it tracks is, is the economy strong or is the economy weak? And the same with charitable giving. Charitable giving doesn't necessarily track exactly tax policy. What it tracks is when people are doing well, they give. When they're not doing well, they cut back on giving. So, the broader issue here is, how do we get a growing economy where businesses, employers, families are doing better and they're getting the kind of real growth and real wage, wage uh, increases that I think will help them do both of those things that I often hear about. Uh, Dan, speaking of trade-offs, would you be willing to, as an economic manager, do you think it would be beneficial to trade uh, say, a, an increase to 25% for carried interest and on capital gains in return for a 25% top rate on income. 
if you could get that kind of a trade? I, mean, I, I would have to look at the numbers. I wouldn't be averse to it, but I'd have to like, that requires some analysis I can't do in my head. Okay. Um, the, uh, uh, at this stage, the capital gains rate is 23.8, so it wouldn't be that big an increase. But Larry, what do you think of that trade economically? Definitely. You would do that? Absolutely. How far would you go with capital gains? Uh, how far you'd go up? It was 28% in 1986. Uh, would you take it all the way up? To, would you take it uh, even higher if you had to? Well, the one place where the um, Joint Committee has long had a behavioral response is in capital gains. Yes. And, and I would call their assumptions here modest when it comes to actual behavioral response. But looking at their analysis, 28% is the revenue maximizing rate for capital gains. So t to me, going beyond 28% is simply silly. And so I would say that is the top rate one could expect on a broad-based tax code. Well, and there's an analysis in, in your book about what happened when it went to 33 and what right. that meant. And so there's some really good um, you know, research and underpinnings to why it shouldn't go to the levels that it has before. But how, about you, how do you feel about that trade-off, capital gains going up, income rates going down? Well, this is a big puzzle that has to be put together, but clearly you want to have um, capital gains rates um, not too high that they end up not, they end up being counterproductive, which that can happen. And Larry analyzes a lot of this economic data in his book. And clearly our experience has been as a nation that at 33, it's too high. Okay. <clears throat> Stan Druckenmiller. <laughs> living on a fixed Stan, income. you've got the... Uh, living on a fixed income. <laughs> Let me... Larry, if there's anybody who's thought about this, it would be you. Um, you're talking about capital gains at 28 in the context of having a corporate tax rate. What if we took corporate tax rates to zero and all the people doing all the nonsense in Puerto Rico and with lease backs and everything else, that goes away, and then you normalize capital gains and dividends, you're not being double taxed. Think about economic actors out there who have a 0% tax rate on making their economic decisions. You simplify everything. And I think politically the fairness angle is coupon clippers and rich people and frankly the elderly who have been taking from the young and the six people in their 60s have six times the net worth of people in their 30s. So right now, millionaires in their 60s are paying less tax rates than the 30-year-old plumber. Have you thought about what about a higher capital gains rate if corporate tax rates were zero in this whole subject? And has somebody thought about scoring this? Thank you. The, um, uh, it's a great question. Um, the, the approach I end up taking is kind of, is, is, is along the same lines. Because what we need, and this is the thrust of your question, is a single layer of taxation and not multiple layers of taxation. And there's no question that the effective tax on capital is higher than it should be for this tax at both the corporate level and then again at the individual level. Um, and the way you do it I think makes a lot of sense. Uh, I, uh, what I suggested in the KISS tax was, um, let's just do it all at the business level. So there is no personal income tax. And um, all of the above, the dividends and the interest and the capital gains is all taxed regardless of what type of income it is. So we don't have to go through the complexity of saying this is a capital gain and this is interest and it's all taxed on a cash flow basis at the business level. Because that's the guy actually making the decision to create the job or to invest or to do a plant as opposed to the individuals out there. Um, I, I, I would go, you can do it either way, um, but I vote for the way I did it on simplicity basis. Yes, sir. Right here, uh, the second row. Ken Gilman, um, keeping in mind your principle of KISS and the way, 
on, on the one hand, and the way that they tax in Hong Kong, for example. On the other, uh, the tax code now is one size fits all. What, whatever you think the law is, it applies to everyone. Why couldn't you have a plan A and a plan B? The plan A is what we have, and the plan B is no deductions, everybody taxed at the same rate, as low as it can be, and if you decide to switch to plan B, you're there forever. Yeah. And over time, you don't have to force everyone into the same uh, model. And the wisdom of the simplified tax code with the lowest rate would, in fact, prevail. And you only get one, t one, t one chance? You get to change Just once. once. And once you change, <laughs> it's forever. But if you're right, the lower rate should prevail over time. You will need some risk takers to uh, dive in uh, uh, to, to, to that and show the example. What do you, what do you gentlemen think of that? So um, I understand the logic. Um, but here, here, here's a, a basic fact. Whenever you give taxpayers a choice, they are going to choose the one that makes sense for them. But if everyone gets to choose the one that makes sense for them, it means that taxes would be lower than the other receipts would be lower than they otherwise would. So if you want to collect the same amount of revenue, you would have to have higher rates under both the simple tax and under the complicated tax than you otherwise would. So for me, the trade-off is um, not to go with a choice, to go with a one size fits all. Anybody else? Uh, yes, back there, uh, 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 the microphone right behind you, sir. Thank you, Steve Hockman. I, I, I agree with all your goals, okay? And, and you know, lower rates and less and more revenue, uh, and also, of course, simplify, as both of you said. Here's my question. The way you can do it all, one of the great things that Reagan did is he got rid of the, dis, uh, the difference between capital gains and ordinary income. Now, it's true it was 50%, which is kind of harsh. You can get, whether it's 25 or 28, doesn't leaving it without uh, any problem if all you did is get rid of all the tax subsidies, all of them. Now, that doesn't mean you, you may have to subsidize poor people, but a lot of the tax subsidies, whether it's the, mo the worst and the most expensive is 140, I think $130 billion a year by having health care benefits that give, come from the employer tax-free uh, and not part of their compensation. A lot of the people, of course, are, are, are rich people. They don't need it. Sure, so sir. my question is, would you be willing to get rid of every single tax subsidy? Now, I'm not saying you've got to do it overnight. You, you know, I understand that maybe you have to phase it in over time. But the goal would be get rid of, and I mean the charitable, the churches and the synagogues, and, 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 and the things that rich people give art to museums. Okay. And everything is free. We, we, all right, th sir, thank you. We've got it. So, so um, bring up a book on the way out. Uh, <laughs> the, 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 the KISS tax does that, but it doesn't get rid of the home mortgage interest deduction. It doesn't get rid of the charitable deduction. It doesn't get rid of all those deductions. It gets rid of the income tax. So, you can have all the deductions you want, but you're deducting against a non-existent tax. So rhetorically, I think that's the easier way to go. Well, what I heard uh, uh, Congressman Camp say is that uh, you're going to start uh, tabula rasa, and you're going to see what, yeah. how many of those deductions they can, as a political matter, get out to get the rate as low as you can possibly get. We're looking at all those. Uh, as I said, that's sort of the statement. Everything's on the table. We're looking at all of those items. And obviously, we're taking the revenue that would come from those adjustments to bring rates down. And the reason I think it's important to do this is we have historically low interest rates now. And if those interest rates tick up to anywhere they've been in the past, and even an average, we're going to have a, a tremendous economic problem. So we need to be ready to shift to a pro-growth tax code uh, if the time comes. But yeah, we're looking at all all of that. Uh, Dan? So yeah. I, I love Larry's proposal. It's a little bit theoretical. You're working in the yeah. real world. So I want to ask a real world question. In your, what you're looking at, and since many of us are New Yorkers here, and this is an issue near and 
dear to our heart from a personal perspective, although we have a different view from a policy perspective. Are you considering taking off the table the deductibility of state and local taxes? No, we're looking at that. Absolutely, we're looking at that. We're looking at everything. That'd be good for Florida. Yeah. Well, and and again, I mean, <laughs> well, but you know, the, the, again, should, should the people of Oklahoma be responsible for the level of state taxation in New York? And I think there's an issue, a very good case to be made. They shouldn't be. And I picked Oklahoma for a reason. <laughs> well, I think and the other benefit, it was it force real state tax competition, where you yes. would have the state uh, legislators would really have to see what they could get, uh, what they could really uh, do without the federal deduction. We have time for one more question. We got it. Yes, back there, sir, right there. Obamacare, which raises taxes by, depending on how you define it, $1.2 trillion over the next decade. Over a trillion. Uh, so if one creates a tabula rasa for the tax code, does that also incorporate making substantial changes to the tax changes associated with the Affordable Care Act, and how does that interact with the politics in the Republican conference around uh, repealing, defunding uh, Obamacare? Well, the debate over defunding Obamacare does not impact the tax policy because they're doing it in the context of the CR, so they're not repealing all the, t in, in those discussions. Now it is about, it's a, over a trillion dollars in taxes. It'd be very difficult to repeal a trillion dollars in taxes over 10 years and add in the $700 billion in revenue that came about as a result of the fiscal cliff and the marginal rates increase. That's almost $2 trillion that makes it very difficult to do it. We are looking at, obviously, some of the Obamacare policies in, in, in this uh, tax reform uh, that we can eliminate, some of the, the most onerous that really, uh, but it's gonna be hard to pull all of them out and still um, have you know, a sensible approach to this. Well, uh, we are going to be watching, Congressman, very closely to see uh, how this how this goes. We wish you we wish you the best, certainly, uh, uh, and someday it will happen. Uh, uh, there's no question about that. Um, my thanks very much to Larry Lindsey uh, uh, and uh, Chairman Camp and and thanks. Dan Loeb, and thanks to the uh, Manhattan Institute, and above all, thanks to our audience. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I think it is clear how fortunate we are to believe in the power of ideas. Supply the common sense and the fresh thinking to the Manhattan Institute.